Hello, everyone. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to also thank the Taiwan Digital Publishing Forum for bringing me out here. It's also my first time to Taiwan, which is very exciting. I have not had a chance to see the city yet, so that is going to be what I do for the next 24 hours. Um, I'm going to take a different approach uh, to the subject today than Garth. Garth's overview was of the IDPF and the work in general. I'm going to get more specific about EPUB as a file format and how we're starting to recommend that publishers use it to encode content. Uh, and then segue into discussing what we've now learned from two years of commercial reading systems uh, in terms of best practices, some newer uh, publishing distribution technologies that are coming out, and just general recommendations for companies who are beginning to create reading systems today uh, and learn from some of the reading systems that have, that have sort of began the EPUB revolution and are now looking to evolve. So the way I think of EPUB at its best, because of its reflow capability, is that it should be extremely simple. Now, simple does not mean that it cannot have complex layout and styling and advanced features. What it means is that it should be the closest expression to the meaning of the text as possible without extraneous markup or unnecessary styling. And the reason this is important is because of the diversity of reading systems that we already see today in terms of various screen sizes, screen technologies, and new systems that we don't even know yet what their characteristics will be. Uh, when EPUB was first released, really the only reading system uh, was Adobe Digital Editions, which ran on a desktop computer. But then very quickly, we saw EPUB being read on e-ink devices that were somewhat smaller size. And then really what has driven the adoption of EPUB and other reflowable formats in the US and Europe particularly has been reading on mobile phones where the screen size has gotten very small. At the same time, only this year then the, we had the iPad introduced and that is again yet another screen size. So we don't know at this point what the various shapes and technologies are going to be for reading systems. However, we're producing content today that should be flowed onto those reading systems and will exist long after those reading systems have, have moved on. Um, so when we just talk about reflow, there is always an understanding that not every publication is suitable for EPUB. Uh, one example is a form of poetry called concrete poetry, where the exact position of every letter and the orientation, sometimes moving in curves or diagonals, uh, is critical to the meaning of the text. These are, these are works that are never going to work well in a reflowable context. But as Garth said earlier, there are all kinds of types of literature that can work well in reflow if they are carefully produced. So uh, this is a book of poetry by the University of Chicago Press, and it flows nicely even on a very small screen, that's an iPhone in the middle, but also looks nice on a large screen because this was laid out very carefully in both the HTML and in its CSS. And soon, hopefully, we will be able to do layout that is vertical and uh, for texts where vertical layout is important, uh, we will have that capability, at least in some reading systems that are optimized for these languages. So when content creators think about making EPUBs, uh, especially uh, the approach I'm going to show will be as if you were starting from scratch, doing this by hand, uh, even though we know that 
is not always feasible. Um, these are the guidelines that at 3 Press Consulting we recommend to publishers who are working with EPUB. So I will try to keep the code to a minimum, but I did want to show some concrete examples. So this is a very simple, let's say, a novel with a title, a subtitle, maybe that's a chapter name, and then two sections of content that have multiple paragraphs in them. Now this is, I would say, the simplest possible markup in XHTML that represents this content. And if you only have XHTML and nothing else in your EPUB, you will get, oh sorry, that font, um, you will get a reasonable layout. You can see all reading systems will show headers as very big, subheaders as smaller, reading systems will show lines between paragraphs, and that will be readable. But in uh, English language publishing, this would not be ideal. This isn't very much like a book. And the biggest problem, again, sorry, uh, is that the author of this book intended for first sentence, second sentence, next paragraph, those are thoughts that, meant, that were meant to come together. And then there should be some indication that we are in a different scene and the other scene follows after that. Without CSS, you cannot tell that the author intended these sentences to have some relationship to each other. So we're going to use CSS only for the purposes of making this look a little bit more like a book and then also to show the meaning of the text. So the first thing we want to do is in English it is proper to indent the first line of every paragraph. And some reading systems will do this by default and others won't. So we will enforce this because it's good book style. And the CSS to do that is very simple and is part of EPUB. The next thing we want to do uh, in web browsers, it is normal to put spacing between paragraphs and that enhances readability on the web. But in books, it is traditional to have paragraphs not have spaces between them. So we're going to emulate that by removing the margin between paragraphs. And then the most important thing in making this book reflect the intent of the author is to show that these sections are meaningful and we will do that by adding some space in between. So our complete CSS for this book says that each section should have some margin at the top and bottom and that will space it out. And when we do that, then we get something that looks much more like a, a book should in English with the first sentence indented and then following sentences wrap around. The two paragraphs that are in the same section are now close together and then we have the space in between to transition to the next scene. And this way we have preserved the intent of the author and this is critical in many fiction books to ensure that these kinds of transitions between scenes or moving from prose to poetry or quotations is extremely important in ebook formatting. And what we often see when this kind of thought is not put into book conversions or when they are converted without anyone who understands the work checking the ebook, many times these kinds of uh, critical author intent is lost. So while this is something that we recommend and seems somewhat straightforward, in practice it can be very difficult and expensive to do this. Every time, uh, every time you make changes to an ebook, you need to go through this cycle of proofing the book to ensure that you didn't accidentally introduce errors in the text. Uh, certainly when books are first converted, 
proofing is extremely important if they've been converted from PDF or print or other forms where errors can be introduced. An important step is always to then validate the EPUB that you, using EPUB check, which Garth discussed. Then there's the cycle of testing this ebook in some number of e-readers to ensure that the styling looks good in a variety of sizes. And later I'll provide some recommendations for testing. Uh, and then you take the outcome of those tests and put it back into revising the styles or revising the HTML. And for some books, doing this manually is, is okay. They may be, it may be a bestseller, it may be a first release that you want to look as good as possible, but it's difficult to scale that to large numbers of books. So when possible, we recommend setting up systems that can do automatic transformation from some format to EPUB. And ideally, you do that manual cycle of, of hand-authored CSS and testing with just a small sample of the books. And if they're all consistent, because maybe they are journal content or they are books from a series or they're all from the same publisher or under the same imprint, Often they're similar enough that you can just do testing on the subset and then run automatic transformations. And at this point, uh, because EPUB is now a few years old, we are actually in a good place where many vendors are now experienced with marking up books in a source format, such as the standard called DocBook, that can easily be transformed to EPUB or to PDF for print or some or other formats that may, you know, for example, Mobi, um, that may still be commercially viable and use EPUB somewhere in their workflow. So when possible, try to set up systems that use a kind of regular markup, which is best if it's XML, but could be there are other systems that could be regular enough to automate this process. So the kinds of common formats that some publishers are starting with may lend themselves to automatic transformation or not. Unfortunately, Microsoft Word, which is by far the most popular publishing tool, um, at least in, in the English language world, um, you can do automatic transformations from Word, but the Word document needs to be prepared very carefully, and it's rarely the case that uh, any given Word document could easily be transformed to EPUB. Um, PDF, because it is not reflowable and is based on the concept of the page, is very difficult to automatically transform to EPUB. There are, there have been some systems and some software, including the free program Calibre, which can convert from PDF, but the output is often not very good. It's sometimes a good way to get started, but generally any PDF that has been converted to EPUB will need to be cleaned up by hand uh, often quite a bit. And then there are older desktop publishing tools such as Quark uh, that used to be very common in desktop publishing and are now um, being taken over by other tools such as InDesign. And again, those are page layout tools, so they often do not have a good method of producing reflowable content. So we, at this point, recommend for large backlist conversions that you take those documents to a company that does this at scale and work with them, uh, rather than attempting to do this in-house. It's just very expensive and very frustrating, uh, especially for publishers who are new to digital publishing. So ideally, if you can move to a system that uses XML, that's easy to say, but, is, but has a lot of challenges for most organizations. But if you do get there, it's very easy to produce EPUB and you often don't even need to spend any money. The, the tools are, are often free. Uh, because EPUB is really just a, is primarily a series of web standards, uh, for smaller publishers, many find success in using tools for web development to do their ebook production. They have nothing to do with EPUB. They produce HTML and CSS, 
and then you need to do some work to create the other metadata files that are part of EPUB. But at least on a small scale, that is actually quite viable, and many publishers have been happy using tools like Dreamweaver to create EPUB books. And then, luckily, there is at least one system now uh, that's, that is a commercial tool that's used widely by publishers uh, in the US and Europe to create books, um, print books, and that's Adobe InDesign. Version CS4 and now CS5 have reasonably good EPUB output. Again, you need to, uh, much like Word, need to create that InDesign file to some extent with EPUB in mind, but it is theoretically possible to produce an InDesign file that can go to print in PDF and to EPUB with a minimal amount of change. It doesn't quite produce perfect EPUB yet, but it's very close. So if you have these, if you're producing publications that look good, you put them out into the retail channels and you hope that when consumers buy them, they'll be readable and they'll have the features that, that we now understand users want out of ebook readers. So I'm gonna transition into talking about some of the lessons that we've learned from the existing reading systems and a few technologies that are starting to emerge that I believe should be included in future ones. So these are, this is a very kind of high level list of the features that every reading system has at one level or another. Uh, it has the ability to acquire books that might be as, at the simplest case, is just a way to add an individual EPUB file to the reading system. More commonly, we are seeing reading systems that are tied to a particular bookseller, such as Amazon or iBooks on the Apple products, where the reading system can talk directly to a store. And in some cases, you may or may not be able to add your own content as well. Then once that book is, is acquired, then it needs to be displayed. So uh, the rendering engine part of the reading system is the actual code that lays out that text on the page. Then on top of the text itself, the reading system needs to provide the user with access to that book. And that includes not just how to move from one page to the next, but also how to jump randomly into any point in the book using the table of contents or the NCX. And then the last two items are the places where ebooks become important because they're the ways in which ebooks are superior to print books uh, by providing the user with a way to interact with the text, either by customizing it to their reading preferences or by adding their own content and annotations and interest to the book. So, Acquisition is that method by which a book, and could be any publication, I just say book as a shorthand, by which a book gets on a reading system. So it's, to me, I feel that it's critical now that e-books have commercially existed in one form or another for more than 10 years, that users be able to bring their own books into their reading systems. Now, we know that DRM, digital rights management, can make that difficult, but at least in theory, an e-reader should allow users to import their own books. And in this, now that it's 2010, I think it's fair to say that that process should be as easy as possible, and if possible, even wireless. So even the revolutionary magical iPad uh, still requires that users plug their iPad into a computer if they want to transfer their own books, not the books from Apple. And that feels very old-fashioned. So I would like to see more e-readers provide methods to add books wirelessly because they, a user found them on a URL or found, is, found them on their phone and want to send that book to their reading system that might be on a computer. So what at least the major publish uh, the major retailers have been good at is the ability to find and acquire for purchase ebooks in their own store ecosystems and really no one does this better than Amazon and it's always instructive 
and useful to look at their system, even though it is not technically a full EPUB reading system, as a kind of best case scenario for how users should be able to get books onto their device. You, once you're set up, you click once, it beams the book to any of your Kindle devices, uh, which now means uh, could be on a phone, on a computer, on, on their hardware device. And it really could not be simpler. And if you're starting an e-reading system backed with a store, you should at least be as, as simple as Amazon. Now, what I think is really interesting and somewhat new is a specification called uh, OPDS, the Open Publication Distribution System. This is a standard that is based on the ATOM format, A-T-O-M. At OPDS is, is being put together by a number of different interests in the ebook space, uh, some nonprofits like the Internet Archive, some ebook vendors and sellers such as Feedbooks, and a number of reading systems have already support OPDS as a method for finding and acquiring ebooks. And the URL uh, opds-spec.org has the standard. It's very simple and some examples on how to implement it. And the idea here is, uh, and this, this image is from the Internet Archive that is using OPDS under the name Book Server to describe their vision of an open system for vending, lending, and acquiring books, where any reading system on the left can find books from a variety of sources, including for pay, and add them to their reading systems or even borrow those books from libraries. Now, OPDS does not specify any particular ebook standard. It's agnostic about the type of ebook that is transmitted through OPDS. So it is not specifically about EPUB. And in fact, there is a method in OPDS today to say that a given book may be available in a variety of formats. And that is very helpful for users, say, with a Kindle. Uh, they can browse OPDS catalogs and get Mobi format books, while other e-readers may prefer EPUB. But at this point, because Atom is a, is a widely known internet standard, it's easily understood uh, as XML, and OPDS is built on Atom with only a few changes, I think it's fair to say that new reading systems should, should have OPDS support at a minimum because it's very easy to do and provides a great user experience in terms of making it easy for people to find books. So the second major category of any reading system is going to be uh, the thing that's most obvious, which is its rendering engine, how the text appears on the page. And I'm going to talk just about two, uh, probably the two major reading systems and commercial ebook readers today. Uh, the first is Adobe's, technically the name is Adobe Reader Mobile SDK. And this is the technology that they license to nearly all of the e-ink readers to lay out EPUB content and also to use Adobe's digital rights management system called Content Server 4. On the desktop, Adobe Digital Editions, which is on the right, um, is, is basically the same layout engine. So with Reader Mobile SDK, there are now many bookstores and uh, devices, including Sony, Barnes & Noble to some extent, um, and a number of other e-readers that use this system. It has a common, mostly consistent rendering across all these different devices and a mostly consistent common DRM scheme. And this, was, this has been sort of the face of commercial EPUB really until iBooks has come out. And at this point, RM SDK, while it was uh, great for coming out soon and it was fantastic that it was able to be deployed on a variety of e-ink readers, uh, it doesn't have the support of the full support of CSS2 
it doesn't fully render everything that is in the existing version of EPUB, and it certainly does not render some of the CSS3 or HTML5 that's very likely to be in the next revision of EPUB. So we'll see some kind of replacement for this, either wholesale or incremental uh, in the next few years that will never make it back to some of these older e-ink devices, but certainly for the new ones, uh, there'll be an evolution of this technology. Now, where pretty much everyone who is not using RMSDK has gone is to using, generally speaking, web browsers to render EPUB, but pretty specifically, most of the excitement has been around WebKit. WebKit is an open source project by, originally by Apple, that has good support from Google, and it is the, re, it is the X HTML and HTML rendering system built into commercial browsers like Google Chrome and Apple Safari. Because WebKit is provided on most mobile platforms, it has also been used now as the primary reading the rendering engine for a number of reading systems. Uh, the first one that saw wide use was Stanza, that's on the left, on the iPhone. Uh, in the middle is, is Aldico for Android, and then iBooks. And then my reading system, Ibis Reader, um, happens to use WebKit because it runs on a number of mobile phones like Android and iPhone uh, that use WebKit. So, Although there are this huge range of devices, when we talk about that cycle of testing any given ebook, at this point I think it's safe to say that you don't have to buy every one of those devices in order to have a, um, a good EPUB workflow. You can test in just these three categories and, and that gives you very good coverage. So something that uses RMSDK which might just be Adobe Digital Editions on the desktop or, or some e-ink reader. Uh, testing in WebKit on a large device, that really just means like a computer and a web browser. Uh, that's sort of the best case scenario from a publisher's point of view in terms of having room to do a lot of expressive layout. But of course, because mobile reading is so important, it's critical to also look at these publications on small devices. And at this point, m most of the mobile phones that are running EPUB are using WebKit. So the last few things that uh, reading systems need to do, I'll cover fairly quickly. Um, the spine of the EPUB book is, the, is the, the binding of the page. That's the reading order of the book. And of course an EPUB reader needs to display the book in the order in which it was written. So that is the first key thing that an EPUB reading system implementer will need to do is to read the spine of the EPUB and know how to present the publication from the first page to the last page, and that direction may change. The NCX is the method, it is the encoding in the book that shows the full range of the table of contents. Uh, all of the sections and subsections is as detailed as you want. An EPUB reader, in addition to showing the book in its reading order, needs to be able to understand the NCX and present that to the user in such a way that they can easily navigate through the book. And it's surprising how many reading systems don't, at least it, often on their first pass, don't do such a great job of preserving the hierarchy of the NCX, making it clear to users where all the sections and subsections are, and letting them jump through from page to page fairly easily. This is most important in nonfiction, less so in fiction. Then there's just some sort of inherent behaviors that an, a reading system should do that people, that readers now expect. You should be able to close the book, book and uh, go back to it the same page where you left off. Where that gets interesting is that many e-reading systems now are really systems, meaning they're not a single program running on a single device, but they're an ecosystem so Kindle is probably the easiest example of a reading system that can be deployed and read by consumers on a variety of devices. The same feature of remembering where you left off should apply no matter what you're reading. And many reading systems now will do this. If you have read on your computer and then you pick up your mobile phone, 
while on the subway, it should remember that you left off most recently on your computer. And then at this point, most reading systems are still paginated. They reflect the way we expect a printed book to have a single page and then stop and then move to a next page. Not all reading systems are paginated. Some scroll more like a web browser. Some others show just a line of screen at a time, e either for uh, to help people with reading disabilities or, in fact, because sometimes that's a faster way to consume content. But if they do paginate, it should be quick and accurate. And that also turns out to be surprisingly difficult. And some reading systems, even commercial ones, do not do a great job at being both accurate and quick. Then the number of customizations that users are allowed to do is, is somewhat, um, is an interesting tension in the ebook world because you have the competing interests of the publisher and the book designer who think a book should look a certain way and users who may want to change everything about that layout. But because it's an ebook, you must always give the user some level of customization and some e-readers choose to let users customize everything and some just let them customize a few basic things. But I think these are, these are the ones that are critical. Font size is just absolutely non-negotiable. E-readers must let users make the fonts larger and smaller. That is just part of Reflow and it's one of the key features that people love about ebooks. They can make the font bigger when their eyes are tired or if they're an older reader. Then the, changing the family of the font is, is controversial. Some, there are reasons why that can be difficult to do correctly, but again, that's increasingly common. Um, letting users change the colors of the screen and the text is mostly important for night reading. And uh, I did a lot of this on the plane over to Taiwan. You put the text in black and the, I mean, the, the background in black and the text in white, and that just makes it easier to read in, in, in the dark and not disturb people. But then also, it just as important as providing all these customizations is having good defaults to begin with. So the book should look great when the user opens it. They, if they want to make strange changes to it, uh, you should allow them, but the book should be rendered with good fidelity at the beginning. Then annotations, uh, this is some, it's not clear yet how much of what's on this slide is gonna end up in the next revision of EPUB. Right now, this is all up to the reading system. But some of the things that, some of the features that are common are book, the ability to bookmark any page and come back to it and have a way to browse those bookmarks. Also, import and export those bookmarks across, again, different versions of the reading system you know, on your phone, on your computer. Highlighting and note taking is increasingly just a, a core feature that must be included. Uh, dictionaries support, again, may be part of EPUB um, in the coming revision, but another feature that's, that's common, and it, would, it's, it will be interesting if EPUB allows users to change that, even the dictionary that they use to look up words. Currently, e-readers just will supply a dictionary. And then whether users can share and export those annotations into different ecosystems or cross uh, share them with friends is a feature that some reading systems are starting to introduce but is still fairly early and there's a lot of room for innovation and experimentation there. So the summary for reading systems, if you're gonna build one, uh, you have to let users do a certain amount of customization. It's, I think, a fair decision to know how much of that customization to limit, but some things are just, have to be up to the user. At the same time, you need to negotiate with, with the author, with the original text of the book, to make sure that whenever possible, you're honoring what was in the publication and letting the user make overrides only when necessary. And then, Again, it has been surprisingly uh, hard for even some big companies to do. It should, should be fast, it should work well, it should be accurate, and it should be created with the hardware limitations of its device in mind. So when we combine EPUB, a good EPUB and smart reading systems, we 
get this level of customization that also should work well with the original publication. We get the ability to acquire and add books from our libraries very easily to move those books from one reading system to another. To provide methods for reading that are have historically been lacking for people with disabilities. This is just a case where ebooks are manifestly better than print. And so if you have done all of this work, you get an ebook that's better than you get an ebook system that's better than print. And that should be the sort of foremost goal in developing these. If it's worse than print, if it doesn't look as nice, if it's slow, then we failed. But there are so many options for doing innovations in ebooks that you need to start with these fundamentals and then do experimentation from there. So thank you very much. Thank you.